Welcome to San Clemente's Video Library. I'm Joanne Bade, City Clerk of the City of San Clemente. To skip this introduction, click on Skip Intro. This video will play on most internet connections. To fast forward or to advance to a particular agenda item may require additional loading time. To access a particular portion of the meeting, please click on one of the links on the right side of this screen. The Show Help link below explains various features that are available with this site. If you have questions or encounter difficulties, please call my office at 361-8200. Thank you. Call this meeting to order. The City of San Clemente respects the many people of different faiths who reside here. The City Council historically begins its session with an invocation offered by one of the religious leaders of our community with full appreciation of our shared belief that we are one nation under God. And while the City cannot endorse any particular religion, we respect the religious freedom and freedom of expression of all our citizens to pray as they feel led to pray. This evening's invocation will be given by Pastor Chris Smith of South Coast Church International. Please stand for the invocation, and after the invocation, I will lead us in the, the Pledge of Allegiance. Father, thank you for this, this group of men and women who serve us in our community. We just ask you, Lord, after they've had a bit of a marathon, refresh them for all that's ahead. Give them wisdom in the decisions they make. We pray, God, even if they don't agree on everything, that they will walk in unity together. And, Lord, give them the ability to see beyond what's just in front of them and the decisions they make. May they uh, just make great decisions in the future of our city and our community. Again, bless them. Bless this time, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Councilmember Baker. Here. Councilmember Donchak. Present. Councilmember Everett. Here. Mayor Patem Ham. Here. And Mayor Brown. Here. Okay, first item on the agenda uh, is San Clemente High School report. However, Matt Gerritsen asked that that be deferred to May 6th. Next item on the agenda is presentation of a proclamation to Dick Vale proclaiming the month of April as Donate Life Month. Welcome, Dick. Spot treatments are working. <laughs> it's the golf. It's the golf. It always is the golf course. Uh, welcome, Dick. Good to see you. I have here a, uh, a proclamation. I'd like to read a little bit about it, if I could, if you could hold that. And it says, whereas organ, tissue, and blood donations are life-giving act, recognized worldwide as expressions of compassion to those in need, and whereas more than 100,000 individuals nationwide and almost 20,000 in California are currently waiting for organ transplants, and every 90 minutes one person dies while waiting for a donated organ, and whereas more than 600,000 units of blood per year are needed to meet the need of California at any given time, 6,000 patients are in need of the volunteer marrow donors. And whereas a single individual's donation of heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, pancreas, and small intestine can save up to eight lives, tissue donations can save and enhance the lives of up to 50 people, and a single blood donation can help three people in need. And whereas 10 million Californians have signed up with state authorized Donate Life California Registry to ensure their wishes to organ and tissue donors be honored. Now, therefore, I, Tim Brown, Mayor of San Clemente, 
acting on behalf of the City Council and the citizens of San Clemente, do hereby declare the month of April 2014 as DMV Donate Life California Month. And by doing so, encourage all Californians to check yes when applying for and renewing their driver's license or ID card. And uh, I think this is a tremendous thing, but you have a great, a great story here, and I'd love for you to you know, chat a little bit about it and share. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, for those of you here who don't know, and most of you all know because I come back every year, I'm the Donate Life Ambassador for the City of San Clemente, and I'm proud to be that. I'm just lucky to be alive. Uh, six years, a little over six years ago, uh, I was dying, and I needed a heart and liver transplant. And um, in October, the doctors told me, I went to Mayo Clinic, by the way, they said uh, I had about a month to live. And uh, kind of a traumatic time. Uh, and on November the 3rd, I got a call that they had a heart and liver for me. I was at Mayo, Mayo Clinic at the time. And a, it ended up being a 28-year-old kid uh, fell off the roof in South Dakota, landed on his head, was brain dead. They took him to the hospital and they kept him alive. And um, really two days later, I received his heart and liver. So uh, because that kid, when he went to get his license, signed up for Donate Life, in other words, he put the pink dot on his license, uh, I'm here today. There, uh, Yes, I got his heart and liver, um, and 44 other people got stuff from Brian Pavel in South Dakota. Um, eyes, kidneys, tissues, bones, tendons, ACLs. Um, anyway, 44 people are uh, doing well or alive today because of Brian Pavel. But something you may have not known is that I donated my liver. My liver was a good functioning liver, except it had a, a genetic malfunction. And so a guy got my liver uh, at the same day that I got my new heart and liver, and he's alive and well in Memphis, Tennessee. He's going to get the same disease I did, but he's lived six years longer than he would have. So because Brian Pavel signed up for Donate Life, uh, I'm alive, and there's a, gym, a guy named Jim in Memphis, Tennessee who's alive with my liver even though it had a lot of wine and beer go through it. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you on behalf of the Donate Life program in Southern California and for all the people, 11 million now people, who have signed up uh, for Donate Life. So thank you. Uh, Dick, Dick, Dick. Dick. How, how are the sign-ups going with uh, folks when they go to get their driver's license now? Are those numbers increasing significantly? I, I got to tell you, I'm really proud of this. I'm the, I'm the ambassador for the San Clemente DMV, although they're closed right now, you know. And I go there every other month with donuts, and I pump them up, and we are one of the highest rated, you know, getting people to sign up. There are a lot of people who have misconceptions about, you know, they think they, if they're be close to dying or brain dead, that people can just harvest their organs and, you know, just to get their organs. but. It's not true. They have to be certified through, you know, all these doctors and everything. So there is a misconception, and, and it prevents some people from signing up, but it's, it's overwhelmingly uh, more than 50 percent. So. Well, thanks for doing that good work, yeah. Dick, because that's a great thing. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks, Dick. Next is a presentation by Kim Chilodenko, CASA General Manager, concerning uh, matters uh, affecting the Coastal Animal Services Authority. Good evening, Council. Kim Chilodenko, uh, CASA General Manager. I've been asked tonight to give a report of CASA's more recent activity, including our animal enforcement in our um, new parks that have opened. I'm going to read my notes so that I don't leave anything out. Um, so, we currently have four animal control officers that patrol our city parks on a regular basis. We concentrate our efforts, enforcement efforts, in the larger parks that have more activity and residents with dogs such as Verde, Maricosta, and Liberty. The animal control officers patrol the smaller isolated parks as well as the private HOA parks 
when we receive a complaint concerning animals from a member of the public. The officers issue citations or warnings for dogs that are off leash and that do not have a current license or vaccination. Dog owners that do not have a prior history of violations are given a warning where repeat offenders will be issued a citation. The additional parks that opened to leash dogs in 2013 appeared to initially increase our citations and warnings issued by our animal control officers. The, st the statistics have indicated that in 2013, uh, the number of citations and warnings doubled from the previous year. When looking back as far as 2010, I'm sorry, as, as far as 2010, 98 citations and warnings were issued and over 50 in both 2011 and 2012. These significant differences could be a result of many factors, including the number of officers patrolling the parks, the amount of time the ACOs are in each park when not addressing their other calls, or an increase in the compliance rate due to the significantly high numbers in citations for the previous year. As we have initially seen an increase in the number of citations and warnings in 2014, uh, 43 citations or warnings issued to date. When compared to the prior year, we predict that there will eventually be an increase in the compliance rate of leash licensed dogs. As dog owners frequent the city parks more often, they will encounter our animal control officers and other well-informed dog owners. Both will in turn educate them on our San Clemente municipal codes that dictate our leash and licensing laws and potentially result in a decrease in the number of citations or warnings being issued. Um, moving on to more recent issues with or, or um, shelter activities, CASA is currently coordinating efforts with two Boy Scouts that will be working on their Eagle Scout projects at our animal shelter. Both projects will be benefiting our rabbit exercise yard by increasing the size of the current shade structure as well as building a storage shed for their food and extra rabbit supplies. During our most recent vaccine clinic, which we have probably on a quarterly basis, uh, the last one being held, uh, held on March 12th, we offered free rabi rabies vaccinations along with discounted microchips to residents of San Clemente and Dana Point. This clinic was successful as we saw a substantial increase in our rabies vaccines that were administered, microchips sold, and an increase in our overall licensing numbers. CASA's no-cost spay and neuter clinics continue to be successful in offering lower income and all military families the opportunity to alter their animals for no charge. Since the clinics began in June of 2013, we have spay or neutered over 35 animals for our local residents. Our next clinic will be May 4th. Uh, we will soon be partnering with a number of our local veterinarians in a new licensing program that will allow our dog owners the ability to complete licensing paperwork at their vet's office once their animal is vaccinated for rabies. In appreciation for the veterinarian service, we will be acknowledging their participation in this program on the Animal Shelter's website. CASA continues to partner with the Pet Project Foundation on many events as well as benefiting from over a hundred of their volunteers donated their time to work in our cat room, rabbit room, dog walking area, and the shelter's front office. Pet Project Foundation continues to fundraise for our animal shelter by hosting events such as the Tale of Two Cities in March, Flight of Fancy in October, and the Wagathon in May. The Pet Project Foundation has generously donated over $300,000 to the animal shelter that helps pay for a percentage of our kennel attendant staff, our dog trainer, and 100% of the shelter, shelter's animals' medical bills. Uh, we have a couple of promotions currently and in, up and coming in the future. Currently, we have a spring extravaganza. We are offering a promotion for a discount on all of our cat and dog adoptions that are over one year of age. That will be from, from April 8th going on to the 19th. Uh, June is our national Adopt a Shelter Cat Month. And in celebration of this, the shelter is offering $50 off the adoption of any of our cats and kittens. Uh, we expect to have our cat kittens available starting April through October, which is kitten season. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I have one question, Kim. Um, would the um, 
enforcement. Do you include the trails, or, 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 or do you direct your enforcement just into the parks? No, we do enforce the trails, also have enforcement in the trail areas also. So the Ridgeline Trail, the, the Beach Trail. The numbers that I gave you were only for the new parks. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And then um, secondly, how full is the um, facility? What, how many dogs, I mean, what far percent? As dog, cats, yeah, rabbits. The shelter. Um, as of today, we had 18 dogs. We have and, 26 and cats, and we have 16 rabbits. Okay, and how many dogs can you hold total? We can, capacity is 48 dogs approximately 60 cats and 20 rabbits. Okay. So Thank we're you. low, but okay. still have very adoptable animals. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Bob, did you have a question? I'm Kim, sorry, one more Kim, question. Kim, I got a couple of... Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> just a couple of observations. I thought, you, I thought you hit on a fabulous idea. I don't know where that came from, probably from Mr. Ham, about partnering with the vets and uh, licensing dogs there. So I think that's a wonderful idea. We're trying uh, to look at different ways to give the, the public the ability and easier ability to license their animals. And we thought we'd start with the veterinarians because our local vets are a, are a resource for us. So. Wonderful idea. And my, my dog is very happy with his new microchip that was installed at the uh, last... At the last clinic, great. Uh, whatever we call that. Clinic, so, yes. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Clinic. That's, Bob, I echo with that idea. I'm sure he's one of the volunteers that came up with that amazing idea, not me. So I'm not going to take credit for that one. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. We appreciate your time. Well, whoever did that, I think it's a wonderful idea. Thank you. Members of the audience who wish to address council on matters that are within the jurisdiction of the City of San Clemente but not separately listed on the agenda may do so during the oral communications portion of the meeting. A total time limitation of 30 minutes is allocated for oral communications part one with each speaker being allotted three minutes in which to give his or her presentation. And I do have some cards. Okay. First, we have uh, Destination Imagination with Fearsome Fire, which is the... Five, oh, Fearsome Five. I think fire's equally good. You could go with either one, really, at that point. Fearsome is the right word that comes to mind when I see this crew. Destination Imagination DI is an educational nonprofit organization that teaches the creative process to 200,000 students each year from pre-K to university level. Our DI team, Fearsome Five, competed in the improvisational challenge this year. We were given a character from the past, a contemporary character, and a style of makeup. We then had five minutes to prepare a skit solving a pandemonium and incorporating all of the elements. We came in third at both the regional and the state tournaments and have been chosen to compete at the global finals. At state tournament against 20 other teams, we were awarded the Da Vinci Award for originality and creativity. We have prepared a jingle for you. Yeah. 
will be we will be proud to represent the city of San Clemente at Global Finals. Any amount of support is greatly appreciated. Thank you for your time. That was great. Thank if you. Farrell has nothing on you. I want you to know that. Uh, would one of you stay behind and give some information to anybody that might be watching on TV that might want to um, send some microphone. money? Explain what school you're with and maybe suggest that's where the donation should be directed? And if you have a teacher or a sponsor? You're getting broadcast attention. on TV, so right into the microphone and just uh, talk what, a little bit about yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what school, who your sponsor we, is. We'd go to different schools. Um, but I think. Do you have a sponsor or a faculty sponsor? Um, oh yeah. Well, Bernice or middle school would be a good contact because they know about this and they are aware that we. Are and do you have a fundraising goal? Uh, well, it's about probably fifteen hundred per person. So, yeah. Um. We're doing other uh, fundraising things at other restaurants where we get a portion of the money we raise, but we're just trying to collect as much as we can and um, as much as you know people are willing. So anything we get is. So if someone sent a check to the Fearsome Five, courtesy of Bernice Air School, it would get to the right adult. Um, yeah, it would actually be made out to a Destination Imagination. Okay, Destination Imagination. I think. Oh. Yeah. Could you say that into the microphone? Yeah, you go. Yeah. Uh, Principal Holly felt would cut, would make sure the money got to you yeah. guys. All right, very good. And and really quickly, is there an email address that folks can email you about for more info? Your PayPal, you know, whatever. <laughs> um. I'll tell you what. Why don't you have someone send it to the city, and uh, they can email email Mayor Brown T at sancomany.org if you want more information. So if you could just send and we me can an email we can all, we'll anything. put something out on our web page also just to direct them to the proper place. So once we get that email, we can pass that along as well. Sounds great. And oh yeah, when's the date? When do you guys have to go? Uh, oh May nineteenth. Oh, so everyone needs to show up quickly with their checkbooks. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm gonna call Farrell immediately. You know. Anybody's tax return could go to destination. Bingo. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Imagination. Your income tax return. Thanks, guys. You did great tonight. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Curly Snyder, and following Curly is Richard Phillips. Greetings. Um, I hope Joanne put a letter and a picture in the, your packets about the uh, sign that says pizza down at the Pier Bowl. Uh, I walk the pier every day and that sign appeared. It's bright red and it's as big as the uh, existing sign. And it detracts from the San Clemente sign where a lot of people take pictures when they're visiting San Clemente, and that pizza sign just stands out something horrid, that's horrible. And it doesn't go with the motif of the fishermen. They spend a lot of money down there making that beautiful, which it is. And to ruin it with that red pizza sign that stands out like a sore thumb, it can be seen by the passengers on the trains and the people that visit the pier, and if they're taking pictures of that, it it shouldn't be there, I don't think. I think that we have ordinances against putting a sign over a sign, especially that's something that's part of a menu. Um, it, that, to me, it's an eyesore, and I'm sure there's an ordinance against it because when I had a hamburger stand in San Clemente, somebody was on me all the time for my signs. And I had to pay fees. And I just wonder if anyone paid a fee to put up two signs down there, one walking from the pier says pizza then the one right under you know that you see when you enter there there's a problem with that too with the people on the train and incidentally I was thinking about your problem with the uh, the building the new restrooms going in down there about spending more money for the backs of them uh, a good thing would be to look at the what they did with the watershed den at the wrecking yard wall down there. That's a beautiful picture down there. 
And if you could do something like that on the back of these buildings, the new ones are going in down there, it would probably be good for the passengers coming out of L.A. That's the first thing they see on the coast is the restrooms. And if you could put something on there, like Woody's on the pier, something like this, it would be great. It would save you some money, and I'm sure somebody would volunteer to paint those pictures for you. Thank you. Very clever. Thank oh, you, Mr. Is, Steiner. Is, uh, is there a uh, ordinance against these signs? Let's have uh, Mr. Garrison. Uh, yeah, actually, actually, code enforcement was notified of that, and the sign was removed. And the manager of the restaurant was up at uh, planning today, uh, pulling permits to see. And uh, I don't think it was issued permits because there's some issues associated with it. But so right now, the sign is down. Oh, I was there at 11 this morning. It was still up. Yeah, I think I, I got the notice after that. So uh, maybe, Jim, do you know? I don't know if you knew about this or not, but I believe the sign was down, so. I don't know if the sign was down. <clears throat> I was told the sign was down. Am I wrong? Uh, I'm not, I don't know for sure if the sign's down or not, but I do know that he was in for permits today, and he has to comply with the, the sign regulations. They're allowed two permits for temporary banners for a, day, uh, for a time of 30 days, no longer. So he'll be in for that application. There was a couple problems with the application that we're smoothing over, and so he will be made to comply with city regulations. Well, it's a shame that it has to face the trains coming in down there and takes away from that big sign that the railroad, I guess, I don't know, railroad or sign, but anyway, that goes home with a lot of people that are visiting San Clemente. I've seen them lined up down there taking pictures of themselves with Descenderology or whatever, and that pizza sign just ruins the whole motif of the Pier Bowl area. I know as fishermen, they spend a lot of money down there. We'll so definitely that, discuss that the is, location that, of it, that, too. That hey, Mr. Snyder, thank you for bringing that to our attention, and we'll, we'll definitely get that addressed. Uh, it is an iconic yeah, you know, piece it, of sand. Yeah, let once we determine that he's put a permit in and if the permit allows him to do that, let's, let's suggest that we talk to him anyway because he's a great citizen and runs a good business down there, and I'm sure that if we request it independent of the zoning and rules. Yep. And he's already, he's already contacting me directly, yeah. so absolutely. Right. I do like the idea of the, uh, of the paintings down there for the trains. It's kind of cool. Yeah, no, well, <laughs> have some grief. Yeah, Curly, you're on it today, man. Uh, so uh, next is Richard Phillips, and following Richard is Brenda Miller. Good evening. My name is Richard Phillips. I live here in San Clemente, and I'm a runner. I like running in our parks, especially up on the San Clemente Ridgeline Trail, starting just up the mountain from here by the water tower all the way to the uh, hill overlooking the high school. And recently on my runs, I've been having a pretty serious problem with people walking dogs off-leash up on that trail, which is illegal and unsafe. Uh, I've seen off-leash dogs on the trail up there chase wildlife, you know, rabbits and squirrels. Uh, I've had dogs approach me. I've seen off-leash dogs approach dogs that are legally being walk, walked on leash on the trail, and I've seen dogs digging and generally making the trail kind of unpleasant for everyone else. And uh, this is a real problem. It deters me from using the trail because I don't feel safe approaching a large dog off-leash. I don't know what it's going to do. The owner might think it's safe, but I don't necessarily. Uh, so I've had to cut run short if I see someone with a big German Shepherd or something. I've uh, seen dogs approach leash dogs and potentially you know, get close to starting fights, and I've talked to other people that use the trail that have told me they have similar concerns. They don't like walking their dog there on a leash, they don't like running there or taking their kids there, because there are a lot of people that have a lot of large dogs there off leash. I really think the solution to this is twofold. I think first, the city should install some signs on the trail letting people know that it's a leash only area. It would be said there are some signs now, but they're not very prominent. Maybe something more visible near the entrances to the Ridgeline Trail would help people understand that if they have a dog there, that's fine, but it needs to be on a leash. And second, I think there needs to be better enforcement upon the Ridgeline Trail. I run there probably once a week. Uh, probably 90% of the time that I run, I see at least one dog off leash. If I go on a Saturday evening or a Friday evening, I'll see three or four, no problem. And I've never seen an enforcement officer, never seen anything uh, done about it. I've talked to a couple of the dog owners walking dogs off leash and just told them I'd really appreciate it personally if they'd use a leash and you know, let them know that it's the law in San Clemente. And I've never had someone say, hey, I didn't understand or anything like that or I'll do it. They always try to say, hey, my dog's nice. I'm not going to do it. I don't care what the law is. Uh, so I think that signs might deter some people, but some people, the message needs to be put forth a little more bluntly to them, unfortunately. 
Uh, I realize that some people might think this isn't a huge concern. You know, a dog off leash, who cares? Probably not going to hurt you. But I don't know what every dog is like. Uh, you know, the eight-year-old girl walking her toy, toy poodle doesn't know what a dog is like. The 85-year-old person walking on the trail doesn't know what every dog is like. And a leash gives us the security of knowing that at least the person has some level of control over their dog. I brought a map with me. I suspect you're all familiar with the, uh, the area. The green I've drawn on here is the Ridgeline Trail. The area where I really noticed the most problems with dogs is right between the water tank at the top of the mountain on Salvador and the dog park itself. There's a little cut off from the trail here. I would say that if, if an officer walked this on a uh, uh, Friday afternoon, Saturday afternoon, about an hour before sundown, they'd probably see three or four people walking a dog off leash up there. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. I'll have a yeah, customer. Yeah. You, you came on a fantastic night. I don't know if you heard the presentation right. earlier by I the CASA the director. It's, it's good. And we have an enforcement officer listening right here, and I saw her nodding her head a couple times. So I'm sure that you'll be seeing her up there real shortly. So All right. thanks Thank for you. bringing that to our attention. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Uh, next and last is Brenda Miller. Uh, hi there. Um, Laura is going to put up a graphic from OCTA, and I'm here to announce that Bike Month is coming in about a couple of weeks, and hopefully we can put that graphic on our city web page, and I can send uh, the proper link to the OCTA site so it can be hot linked. Um, that would be great, but OCTA always does a fabulous, fabulous job promoting Bike Month. And just to give you a couple of highlights, a week from today up at the Fullerton train station is going to be the dedication of the county's first, I believe, bike share program. Um, there's a bike festival on April 27th at the Huntington Beach Pier. And if you'd like to bless your bike, um, on Wednesday, May 7th at the Santa Ana Metrolink Station, a ride to Santa Ana City Hall at 7 in the morning to 9 a.m., there is going to be a blessing of the bikes. Um, there's a great bike rally. I attend this. I try to do it every year, May 15th, Thursday, 7.30 to 8.45 in the morning at OCTA um, headquarters. Everybody kind of rendezvous at the Orange Metro Lake Station, and then we all ride as a group to the OCTA headquarters. It's great. Um, there's a ride of silence on May 21st in the evening starting at 6.30, departing North Beach. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's um, kind of a somber event. People gather. They're very quiet. There's really not much talking. Um, we have headlights. We have taillights. And we ride during twilight hour in memory of those who have lost their lives on the roadway. Um, and I have done this once. There's another um, event, similar event at Irvine City Hall. Um, Saturday, May 24th, there's a bike safety camp at Pavilion Park in Irvine. Um, so once again, OCTA is on top of it promoting bicycling. I think this is fabulous. And if I may, in my minute left, um, give the council a bit of an update. I rode my bike to the Irvine City Hall last night for um, the OCTA bike safety workshop and meeting. Um, I was extremely impressed, and I didn't think I would probably live long enough to see what I saw at that meeting last night. But CEO Daryl um, Johnson, thank you. Daryl Johnson was there, um, chairman of the board. Uh, gosh, what's wrong with me tonight? Um, Sean Nelson, <laughs> Jeff Lalloway, uh, vice chairman of the board, and Todd Spitzer, who's also on the OCTA board, in addition to our own Bill Cameron and um, Orange County Sheriff representative and also an Irvine PD representative. And the topic was bike safety. And everyone, especially the OCTA executives, were un in an unprecedented fashion willing to listen and ask for assistance in how we can make our roadways safer for bicyclists and, frankly, also pedestrians. They're very, very sincere. They want to make a difference. And I, I think they're just stellar. Um, so they should be commended. Honestly, it was a wonderful, wonderful meeting. Um, we were all impressed. It was well attended by um, bicycle advocates and bicyclists. There were elected officials from other communities in Orange County there. Um, so it was, it was a great community effort to collaborate in the name of public safety. So I think they deserve kudos in every way they can get them. So thank you. Thanks, Brenda. We'll make sure and get that up on the website. Right. Chris. Brenda, I have a quick question for you. The ride of silence on Wednesday, that doesn't start at St. Clemente and Ender Irvine, correct? Um, it's in two locations. Okay. It doesn't, you know, those are okay. two start points, two different rides. Gotcha. Where does it, where does the St. Clemente ride end? Um, if it's the same one as last year, we meet at North Beach and we ride to Dana Point Harbor and then we ride back. Okay. So. 
It's about eight miles round trip, but under 10 for sure. Thank you, Brenda. Any other cards? No. Sorry. Can we have a motion to waive reading? So move. Second. Motion by Donchuk, second by Ham. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 5 0. Closed session report, City Attorney. No action to report. All items listed on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion without discussion, unless council staff or the public request removal of an item for separate discussion and action. I have not received any requests for removal. Okay, I'll start with Jim. Jim, any items tonight? No. Chris? Bob? D and J. D and J. Okay. And Lori? And I have no items. Move the balance. Second. Motion by Don Check, second by him. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 5 0. Uh, starting with item D, Bob. Thanks, Jim. I, uh, I pulled this because I'd like to have a, a little update for the folks watching at home. I think this is a very important program, and I think it's a, a, uh, uh, an, an example of some well spent funds. So, would you? Would you give us a little brief synopsis for those watching at home? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, actually, I'm pretty excited about this. Um, as the council knows, but maybe not all the public, right now, it, if you want to build anything on a coastal canyon in different parts of the coastal zone, in order to get your permit, you have to go all the way up to Long Beach and go through a process that can last anywhere between six months and a year to get a permit. So our goal is to improve our customer service and allow our local people to process permits within the city of San Clemente. So that's one of the key goals of, of getting the LCP adopted for the city. Permit authority from the Coastal Commission will transfer to the city of San Clemente. Um, the second goal is that who knows best how to manage the coastal resources than the community itself. So what it does is it gives us the authority to make important coastal resource decisions by us rather than people that are up in Long Beach that are appointed by the governor and, and other people. Um, it gives local control. So that's, that's our main key goals with the project. Um, I do have uh, um, Joe Monaco of DUDEC, who is the vice president of DUDEC, and Ann Blemker. She's uh, with McCabe and Company and used to be a coastal analyst at Long Beach. I used to work with her a lot of projects. She has a ton of uh, knowledge in regard to our coastal zone. And Joe grew up in Dana Point, so he's got a lot of local knowledge as well. So they're a great consultant team. Also, Don Brown, who's on the Planning Commission and on the Coastal Advisory Committee, uh, participated in the process in uh, interviewing Dudek and McCabe and um, verified their qualifications. And so we're really happy to have them aboard. And I can't wait to get started. I think this is a really important project. And the reason I wanted to publicize it a little bit is because it's going to be such a huge time and money saver for everybody, for the Coastal Commission and uh, the homeowners that are affected by this. So uh, I, I, I can't wait to get started. So with that, I'll move the item. Second. Motion by Baker, second by Ham. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5 0. Next is I. Thank you. Jay, thank you for coming tonight. Hey, Gus. Item J. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. That's gran Council. grandfather Gus, by the way. I just wanted to oh, uh, very notify nice. really? Council okay. in case you haven't heard. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> I feel like one after a week of having a baby. I look at you in a whole new way now, Gus. <laughs> very thank you. Yeah, very impressive. What can I answer for you? Well, uh, Gus, the I see we're we're doing uh, we've expanded our fundraising golf tournaments at the municipal golf course uh, from one to two, and now this would be the third one. Do we uh, do we or should we have a policy? Because after three comes four, and then five, and then six, and then you know. Well, we do have a Should policy. we have a little, little more uh, definitive policy on this? In the operating resolution, we have a policy where there's a council has established a charity fee. It's currently at $10, which is green fee only, does not include carts. We don't own the carts, so we can't offer a discount or give those away. Um, it's, 
The charity rate is, however, seldom used. Um, most of the people that are, the groups that apply for it are not bona fide uh, nonprofits. They don't have their paperwork in order, and so we can't give it to them. Uh, some of the larger groups, uh, well, the two that currently have it are the Boys and Girls Club of San Clemente and the uh, Parks and Recreation Foundation. They're two fairly large groups in town, and now uh, Family Assistance Ministries has applied for one, and I think uh, we can probably handle three. I, I did put a caveat in there that uh, we should annually take a look at the records of these three turn or two tournaments now and possibly a third to see, one, if they're... Uh, if the money is actually going to benefit the community, and two, if they're generating enough revenue at the golf tournament to possibly offset costs in the future at the golf course. Oh, well, Gus, really, that's the that's the point that that uh, frankly needs to be made. Those are three terrific organizations. All three of them, uh, you know, do, do great stuff in the community, and and uh, everybody's in favor of that. But you know, is it really fair to uh, use? golf course facilities and taxpayers and not have them at least pay the charity rate, which is, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I think the uh, we have the policy. Part of that policy is if uh, staff says no, they can uh, request the, through the, via the golf committee and ultimately through council to have the fees waived. That's what both – I would. The Boys and Girls Club has been free for as long as I've been here. It's well, well over 20 years. Uh, the Parks and Recreation Foundation was established a couple, three years ago, I believe, and they went through the same process, and now uh, Family Assistance Ministries is going through the same process. So it's really, uh, it's up to council. For us, it's a loss of about $3,000. Uh, we do over $2 million a year in business. You guys can decide what the right thing to do is. Yes, what's the, uh, how many folks have asked for a similar type of waiver? How many organizations? Uh, I think in the past, uh, the Mary Erickson Foundation, if it still exists, had applied for one, and we'd actually given it to them. Um, but I don't believe they were ever actually able to organize and pull off a tournament. We extended the offer to them, but I don't. Maybe once they did it, um, I'd have to look back at the records. But uh, I don't think they were either were not able to do it, or maybe only did it one time. And I think that's it. Okay, well, uh, with that, I'll be happy to move the item, but I, would, I wanted to pull it up so we, we have some scrutiny on these kind of things and we're not, uh, you know, like I said, those three, those are three tremendous organizations that right. we all support and can't support enough. Right, I, I just wanted to clarify, we do have that policy. We do have a charity rate. They've asked for the complete waiver of the fees, and that's why we're here tonight. Okay. M Mayor, would you like the executive director from FAM to speak? I think uh, she's... Hi, Mary, how are you? <laughs> Uh, good. You know what? It actually would be beneficial just for the folks at home to chat a little bit and maybe get some publicity for the golf tournament. This is an excellent opportunity. No, Dick. No, no, Dick. You stay seated, buddy. We've heard from you. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Dick, come on up here. No, come on up here. It's your this positive is, face. This is time. Dick's I mean, great idea. You know? Dick brought this to us, and we're very excited. Yes, he's an instigator, as you can tell. Um, and we're delighted he's going to be running this for FAM to raise money for us to help people and keep them off the streets and help feed people and help kind of battle that homeless prevention. Okay, folks. Uh, I started the Boys and Girls Club tournament 30 years ago, and I ran it for 15 years. And I, I started the Mary Erickson Foundation golf tournament, and they needed help. And I, start, I ran that for two years, two years ago. And then they, some, we had a hassle, and we, we stopped it, and they couldn't make it go. And then I ran the beaches and parks for three years, and so they're on their way, and I don't do them. My heart was in all of those. My heart and soul is in this one. So it's Dick's fault, essentially, is what I'm hearing here. Yeah. I see a common thread. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any questions? No, we don't. We think it's great. Yeah, what is Dick charging for his services? Yeah. Apparently he's ever <laughs> top on this. <laughs> Uh, I actually, when, when, but what is the date it's projected for folks that August, want to? Uh, Monday, August the fourth. August the fourth. Monday, August the fourth. Okay. Right now, right on now, Friday, the but the, the, the weddings every Friday booked up through the year. Okay. The community. So. And there are yeah. some prizes going to happen, and maybe some teams. Like maybe we can have two different teams from the council yeah. battle each other. Well, I mean. Bob, Bob can be one team and the rest of us will be the other one. You know? <laughs> you know. And where's the battle going to come from? Again? <laughs> I want 36 it's, strokes. It's the golf course, yes. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I think the last thing I just wanted to, to really quickly. And I'll never come ask for the golf course for free again. 
How's that? <laughs> yeah. No, no. You, is, no, I, I, I want some increased scrutiny on this kind of stuff, Dick, and I want some publicity for it too. So that, that's all we're trying to that's You'll all we're trying to do here. Yeah. And Monday is usually is that considered to be one of our lower volume days, and that's yes. why the scheduling mm -hmm. is what it is. Yeah. Except Just for Bob. Bob plays six money. times on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it, Dick. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, guys. And with that, I'll move the item. Second. Motion by Baker, second by Ham. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes 5 0. Next is a report from the city clerk concerning contract legal services. And I'm going to exit the room on this one. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, as you know, Jeff Goldfarb has recently retired from his position as city attorney. The city code uh, gives the city council the appointment authority over the city attorney. For that reason, I have agendized this item to enable you to uh, discuss the issue and, and make a determination as to how you wish to proceed with regard to future legal services. Okay, we have a staff report in front of us. Is there any uh, report or anything you'd like to give a quick summary, Paul, on this, or is this uh, purely council? I, I think it's purely council. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about this. I, I know I've, we've talked individually, certainly, about this, and you basically have two choices, I think, and that is that um, our, our uh, former city attorney, Jeff Ottoman, has offered up his services or the services of any partner that the, that the city council might be interested in interviewing for the position of city attorney. Um, we have the assistant city attorney who just exited the room also is, is will either retain the assistant city attorney or become city attorney that uh, again uh, if the council so chooses the alternative to that is to uh, put out a request for a proposal for city attorney services that the council could then um, interview you know define a process and interview any firms that they might be interested in um, and that certainly would include and I believe the the council would not object to including Rattan and Tucker in that request for a proposal if you so decided to do that so those are basically your two options so and and that is exactly it just to summarize mm -hmm. what's before us tonight is we have um, mm -hmm. two options before us and frankly we can go in a number of different directions but it's exactly as Paul reiterated that we have we can direct staff to um, to continue with Rattan and Tucker uh, to serve as city attorney uh, negotiate the hourly rates retainer fees associated with this continued legal representation of the city and direct staff to return to the council with a formal amendment that identifies the attorneys who will serve as city attorney, assistant city attorney, and deputy city attorney as rates negotiated. Jeff uh, Otterman, who is a partner with Rattan and Tucker, has expressed interest in returning this position city attorney. Or the second option, as Paul reiterated, was to direct staff to issue requests for proposals inviting qualified attorneys and or law firms to submit written proposals to provide legal services for the city of San Clemente. And, of course, Rattan and Tucker will be involved in that. We also have, as a part of this Exhibit A, uh, a listing of the many firms that are currently um, uh, doing business, including any in-house counsel and a referral agents in Orange County. So that is my staff report on the item. Uh, we do have a comment card, uh, and I guess this would be the time to uh, maybe hear that, have some, uh, some public comments. Uh, and we have a card from Tony Beal from uh, Rancho Santa Margarita City Council. Tony, welcome. Good evening. Th Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members, members of the city staff. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. What a beautiful city you have, and you have so much to be proud of. And um, I want to congratulate you and thank you uh, for your service to the community. As a fellow elected representative and city council member, I realize that who you choose for your city attorney is one of the most important decisions that you make. And so I really wanted to make sure that um, the information that I wanted to provide to you tonight was available to you so that you can make a fully informed decision. It's information that I would want to have before me if I was in your chair tonight. Jeff Otterman in the law firm of Rutan and Tucker just a couple weeks ago on May 27th, they sued the city of Rancho Santa Margarita for $10 million in money damages on behalf of a private real estate developer. I don't think it's appropriate for an attorney, a law firm that is representing cities as a city attorney to also at the same time be suing a neighboring city for substantial amounts of money like that. Uh, I have provided a letter to you that summarizes in some detail some of the background that goes into that lawsuit. Um, the, some of the tactics that we have encountered in Rancho Santa Margarita uh, I've never seen before. I've served 
Rancho Santa Margarita for four years on the Planning Commission and for the past 10 years on the City Council. Um, before there was ever a single public hearing at our city, before the public had ever heard of this issue, before our Planning Commission or City Council had ever seen a staff report, we had received three demand letters from Rutan and Tucker, this thick, threatening to sue us for millions of dollars. I felt at our city council meeting when we had the hearing on this rezoning like I had a gun to my head. And I, I don't think those are appropriate tactics. And most importantly for you and um, San Clemente, I believe that the claims and the arguments that they are bringing forth in their lawsuit against us, if they're successful, it will hurt you and the residents of your city, as well as cities across California. It's an inverse condemnation case. And if they succeed, they're seeking to expand the law in ways that it, it just doesn't exist right now. And it would make your city and every other city much more subject to claims such as this that would limit your ability to govern your own land use decisions. So I greatly respect your authority and your discretion to choose who you think is best suited to act as your city attorney. I wanted to make sure that you had this information available to you. Uh, there's many, many qualified firms out there that don't have the same sorts of conflicts that I've alluded to tonight. Uh, I saw them in your staff report. I would urge you to take a long, careful look and consider going out for proposals uh, to those firms. I'm also available to answer any questions, and I'd be more than happy to provide information to you about the background um, of the lawsuit that I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, being here tonight, Councilman Beal. So, I, I, Paul, if I may ask just a few questions. Um, before we deliberate too much I, on this. Rutana Tucker has been our attorney for the past almost 30 years. Is yes, that accurate? correct. Okay, about 28 years. And how often have we revisited the contract of services with Rutana Tucker? Actually, I think the last time we revisited the contract and, and renegotiated hours and rates was about two years ago. Is that right, Joanne? I think it was two, three years ago. Mm -hmm. And at any point, because uh, you've been here since mm -hmm. early 90s, and yep. so... At any point when we revisited the rates, did we ever explore either bringing another firm or restructuring how we did our legal services? You know, second attorney, supplemental advice, you know, other different things like that. During, probably during the term of the, uh, uh, we have sought supplemental advice and used other legal firms for certain cases um, outside of Rutan and Tucker. Mm -hmm. That's been fairly rare. Um, you know, typically if it's something specialized where we needed uh, outside expertise that Rutan and Tucker didn't have, we've done that on occasion, but not too often. And so, did, have we ever, when was the last time you'd say we'd gone to RFP? Was it 30 years ago, 20 years Yeah, I think it was, yes. I don't think we've been out uh, since then. Certainly not during the 22 years that I've been here. Right. We did, uh, just uh, informationally, um, we did back in, I want to say 1993, we did go out and uh, cost out the practicality of retaining in-house counsel and at that time of course this is 22 years ago uh, roughly um, it was determined that that was going to be quite exp more expensive than retaining a city attorney with a regular firm and I, I as I recall and I didn't read the report I do remember when that was presented to council but the um, what ends up happening there and sometimes in a smaller city such as ours and we were even smaller then is that they tend to need staff need uh, you know outside counsel and you know specialties etc so uh, but we haven't we haven't revisited that concept either in the last 22 years at least okay well <clears throat> I'll go ahead and get started, I guess, on my thoughts on, on what we're doing here. Um, you know, I think we've had a, a long relationship with Rutan and Tucker, and, uh, you know, I, I acknowledge the contributions that they've made to our city, uh, you know, when we've had, you know, and there have been successes over the years, there's no doubt about it. Um, I do feel that as a matter of course, similar to how we visit these contracts, and particularly um, with the ever-evolving nature of our city from a large-scale development type approach. Now we're in a very narrow focused infill type thing. We're making a, a fairly large transition. Um, and as I think as a lot of our pro, as our priorities change, and especially new general plan and other items, uh, you know, I think this is the right time to go out to an RFP. I think this is, it's, it's okay to look at your options. I think it's a beneficial exercise. I think it'd be nice to see what other structures are out there what other firms are out there and become more informed. And we may at the end of this process look and say, well, what we have 
uh, works very well. But right now, we don't even know what other options are out there. We don't even know what other uh, firms are out there that could provide a service. And not knowing, um, to me, means that we haven't, that I think this is overdue. And so I, for one, would support the staff recommendation to issue request proposals and invite Rattan and Tucker to also be a part of that and acknowledge their long service and their knowledge of the city and, and understanding. Uh, I've contemplated uh, seriously on this because I do agree that the uh, legal counsel that a city um, engages is one of the most important functions um, that we um, have responsibility for. And I do know the world has changed. Thirty years ago, there were probably only three um, law firms in Orange County that were dedicated to municipal governance. Now I, n I believe there's upwards of 30. So I think that um, there are some opportunities out there that our city might be well served looking at. Um, it's an important decision. I went and looked at what our legal fees were over the last five years, and you know they can go upwards of a million dollars a year depending on what's going on in the city. So, uh, in terms of pure financial stewardship, I think that um, we almost have no choice but to look at the RFP um, process right now, with the uh, encouragement that Rutan and Tucker participate in the process and, if you will, recommit to our city in terms of the talent and the financial structure um, that they might bring to the table in addition to their wonderful institutional knowledge. Uh, so I, I feel that um, it's important at this point. I think the time, if we're going to do it now is the time because we have um, Goldfarb leaving, we have Otterman, you know, um, he's willing to come back, but he's also probably a short-term solution to the city's needs. So it it's, seems like an opportune time to do this. So um, short-term, I would be um, very supportive of going out for an RFP. And then on the heels of that, I'd like to revisit the policy and take a look at it and make sure that um, our policy is in place for making sure that our legal counsel um, is reviewed more frequently than 30 years. Bob. Well, I, I'll also be supportive of, of going out for an RFP, but I would like one thing added to that. I, I think we should also look at hiring in-house counsel. Times have changed in 30 years, and possibly it is time to look at that. And uh, we we may be able to, I also looked at the numbers, and the numbers have, have gone. Uh, I think I think we could find uh, a local in-house counsel for some of these numbers we've paid in the last few years. I understand we'll have to go out for things, but uh, I would also like that as part of the RFP, if uh, everybody's agreed to that, that we, in addition to that, part of that report would, would look at how we would uh, hire an in-house counsel. May I ask a question, just a clarification of Paul? No respect, I really want to hear this, but on an RFP, we're asking for a certain type of service in a standard fashion. Would we want to explore and make a determination previous to the RFP as to what option is preferred and then go to RFP? That would really be my desire. I think we, if we do both of those, that really expands the, the scope of going out. Uh, that's really two totally different things. Um, that would be really good if council could come to some agreement on what, what it was exactly that they wanted. Well, it, I mean, that, that would be my request. Then, then that I would like to have staff contact all the uh, city managers of these, these uh, ten the individual ones listed on our staff report to mm -hmm. talk about in-house counsel and find out how much it work, how it works, and how much it costs. Absolutely, we can do that. And I, and I have not done that in the past, so absolutely. And, and I would also, I'm, I'm jumping out of here, out of turn. But um, typically, I've done a lot of thinking about this and a lot of talking to people, the larger the city, the more it makes sense. So if you look at that list under item 10, you know, they're the Huntington Beaches, um, the Oranges, the Santa Anas. And so there is some population level where it makes sense to have that uh, resource in-house um, is the general rule of thumb. I, I, I think that would be a useful part of the staff report is to delineate what that threshold is. And yeah, that and, and we might be there. Yeah. That's the... And the advantages and disadvantages from there. Okay. Uh, sorry, guys. Th thanks for your patience. Uh, Jim. Yeah, I, I see where we're going with this. You know, I would just say a few things. Number one, you know, we got to mean and think about continuity to make sure we don't lose any continuity on those items that we're already involved in. Um, I would say number two, 
that when we put our criteria together, if we go out with an RFP, that we we understand that dollars shouldn't necessarily be the driving factor. I think with professional services like this, sometimes people make the mistake and think that the cheapest dollars they can get is going to give them the best service. And I think we've all experienced or know that that's just not the case. Um, thirdly, I, in looking at, at the, the input we got from our our friend from out in RSM, uh, I'm not so sure that a lot of these attorneys may at one time or another, with especially bigger firms, sue cities. So I'm not as concerned about going both directions with a law firm as I am about some of the other comments that you made in terms of the tactics and things of that nature. So I think that's something that as we evaluate uh, any bids that come back in that we want to we want to think about that type of activity and make sure that we're getting the right recommendations from other cities uh, try to understand who's had suits and who hasn't um, so I to my thinking those are the the key items that we should be thinking about um, and, and the same token I, I think in terms of my experiences on the the uh, three and a half years here is that the uh, return Tucker has done a pretty good job for us in most instances. Thank you, Jim. Chris? Yeah, uh, I, think, I think we all know where this is going, but uh, my two cents are the, the only concern I have with taking a look at this is San Clemente has seen a tremendous amount of change in the last 30 years. And I see where we run some problems when we make new partners, establish new relationships. People don't know the history of this community. And I see that as an asset in Rattan and Tucker. That being said, I don't think I'm opposed to taking a look and seeing what's out there and seeing what our options are. I think that's always a good idea, especially looking at the long history we've had with Rattan and Tucker. And much to Jim's sentiment, I, I don't see that they've doing a, been doing a poor job since I've been on in the year and a half I've been here. So with that, I think Tim's going to make a motion. And also, Bob, I, I do support taking a look at um, maybe having an in-house attorney. Because just like you said, Lori, there are some big cities on there, but I'll see some little ones, Laguna Niguel and Placentia. So that's something I think we do need to take a look at. Paul, before I make this motion, could you just walk us through really quickly uh, what the process to an RFP would look like and maybe some what potentially the timing would look like? Yeah. I, I, you know, I've not done one of these before, so I, I envision this being a, uh, you know, I want to say like uh, probably between three and six months in total. Um, and certainly would ask the council perhaps to be involved in that. You know, perhaps you could appoint a subcommittee to work with me directly. Um, these are just kind of thoughts off the top of my head, really. But um, um, I think we'd have to do some, especially if we start researching in-house legal. That, that kind of changes the nature of where I was thinking about this and just kind of going out and, and uh, seeking some sample RFPs because we're, we're certainly not the first ones to do this. Um, cities do this all the time. So I would seek... Um, RFPs, examples, um, meet with the council members to determine what's important to them and try to narrow the scope down a little bit in that way. And I, but I do want to reiterate also what uh, Jim Everett said about the uh, costs. It's, it's a little bit, you can kind of go down the wrong path if you're looking for the uh, cheapest attorney out there. Um, and I'm sure there's cheap attorneys and there's expensive attorneys. So um, we certainly look at that also. And, and, and I think we didn't actually, I did not put that in the package, but we have also a listing of what the attorney firms charge. It's kind of hard because it's not really apples to apples in a lot of cases. You know, sometimes they're, they just show the partners and they don't show the lower level staff, et cetera. They give us averages. But, um, but I would, you know, and maybe uh, I don't know if the city clerk has more information on uh, process, et cetera, but that's kind of what I see it in a nutshell. So. The way that the RFP process would work is that, uh, first of all, the uh, request would be compiled. And according to city policy, it needs to be uh, provided to at least five, five firms. Five firms, and, and uh, at least three need to be interviewed. Is that, is that after, after they've submitted their bid packages or prior to their... Uh, when, when, when is the interview process uh, uh, happening? Uh, that would be after you receive the, um, receive the bids. You'd right, because away you, could you could negotiate the prices okay. after that, too. And by the way, that, that's a minimum. I, you know, I, I predict that we would use that listing that we have that I mm -hmm. attached to the staff report that we would probably send them out to all of them, okay. you know, all the ones that are, we feel are qualified. And I'm sure we'll get some others outside of that. I'm, al I'm already starting to get emails, so. Okay. Yeah, I noticed that. Uh, I'm going to take a shot at a motion and see if maybe this is the direction we want to add here because I think it's going to be a little bit more than a request for proposal. 
Well, I, I, do we really need a motion tonight, or can we? we well, I think I guess we're providing give, direction. I think we give direction. a direction here. Do we really need to make a? Do we want to memorialize with a vote? Excuse me, let me ask our attorney. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's important to have a summary and. Good for direction. I, I, think, I think we can provide direction through a vote. So I, I would think that we would want to direct staff to do the following. Uh, first, first to review um, the structure uh, of currently how we have our council, which would be in-house uh, versus contract, uh, and determine or do a review of our legal policy as part of that procedure. Uh, and once we have um, come to some agreement on what the structure would look like, then we would uh, issue a request for proposals inviting qualified attorneys and or firms to submit written proposals to provide legal services for the City of San Clemente. It should be noted that Rattan and Tucker would be eligible to submit a written proposal if Council determines to issue a request for proposals with the caveat that uh, some of the items contemplated in the request for proposals would be uh, that we would um, prefer to have some continuity in our services, someone that would be familiar uh, with City of San Clemente, uh, that um, pricing would not be the overall or motivating factor, that that would be one of um, some other factors, and we would also um, want to, uh, we would also want to lean towards experienced firms, uh, firms that have a proven record, uh, and or counselors that have attorneys that have a proven record uh, as part of the factors for consideration. And before I end, anything else I missed in that? Chris? Yeah, I think continuity, um, staffing, work plan would be the three, th and then price. Okay, and then and the then right, who would be our staffing as part of that? Who would be representing us? And then lastly, you know, what the, what the work plan would be as that. And that is my motion. Second. Motion by Brown, second by Everett. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Passes five zero. And next is a report from the Beaches Parks and Recreation Director concerning the County of Orange Library expansion project. He's coming back in right now. I just saw him. Okay. And this report will be by the Assistant City Manager. So good evening. I'm going to kind of go backwards a little bit with history. I'm going to hold that spreadsheet and we can bring up some additional detail if necessary. Uh, to refresh your memory, in 2011, the council executed a funding agreement for the library expansion project. At that time, the estimates that we were using was about $1.6 million in total. One million of that dollars or that funding was going to be, was addressed or is addressed in our current funding agreement. Uh, to refresh your memory, there are three different pots or buckets of money. There was Telega money, which the county already has, about 646000 There's 250000 in Marblehead fees that we are holding that we would give to the county, and then the Friends of the Library for $200,000 that the county would utilize. As you are aware, the bid for the uh, actual construction contract or the construction bid closed in early February. And as we were working with the county, drilling down on all the project costs, and I want to make it clear, the project costs not only include construction, but it also includes architect and engineering fees that have already been incurred or may be incurred during the actual project with cha changes to plan specs and so forth. We we're able to basically determine that the total cost of the project budget is $1.8 million. I'm just kind of rounding for simplicity purposes. Mm -hmm. However, we only have identified about $1.5 million in funding in total. And if you remember, that 600000 that was going to be the city's responsibility, we had identified a developer improvement fund to fund that $600,000. Now, m much of that money was going to be reimbursed to the city as deferred maintenance from the county. In the last I want to say four business days, we've been working feverishly with the county, and the county's been very gracious in terms of changing some of the funding structures. Specifically, they aren't going to require us to front any money for reimbursement. They're going to cover those costs. We had some recent ADA improvements that came up in the bid that was a cost that wasn't allocated that the county has now taken on. And so kind of to bring it back to the bottom line, tonight what we actually have to do is change one of the, one of the recommended staff recommendations we need to appropriate $326,345 to make this project whole. 
Um, the developer improvement fund, which we thought would originally front the 600,000, well, the good news is, is we're only going to need to ask for about 300,000 of that developer improvement fund, which we currently have the money to fund that. Uh, we won't be getting any of that reimbursed. It'll be complete out of pocket from the city. We do have some control with some of that money because it is allocated to contingency. So hopefully the bid specs are tight enough to where there won't be a lot of change orders, but I'm going to be realist realistic. There's always a few change orders. But the, late, the, the, the less change orders that we incur, the less money we have to spend out of pocket. So that 326 could be less. But I don't want to promise anything and rather have it covered in the off chance we have some major issues. And we have always said during the progress of the construction, we're going to be coming back to council, communicating how the progress is going and identifying good things or shortfalls that may be coming in with construction. So I'm going to kind of cut it at that. I expect questions and I stand ready for questions. We also have representatives from the county as well here if you want to ask them any specific questions. Uh, um, yeah, Jim. Yeah, I got the first question is, let me just try to get right to the bottom line. So the bottom line was originally we were going to front some money that we would get back through maintenance later point in time. So the bottom line is the cost to the city, additional cost, was zero. And now it's $326,000. In simple terms, yes. However, keep in mind that we have $250,000 in like, Marvel. I like to be simple. <laughs> yes, correct. We are on the hook for an additional $326,000. Okay. And I'm assuming that that a good portion of that is because of estimates coming in higher than we planned, especially with the ADA. And we were oper things. Yes, we are operating under estimates from 2011, right. and now that we have bid costs in and we have all the other costs collected, we're seeing a higher cost. Okay. just wanted to understand that. Eric, uh, steer um, your ADA improvements, $255,000. I know we're talking money here. Uh, could you give us a couple of milestones? When will they be breaking ground? Uh, when will the temporary library be open for business? And when will the project be finished? Those are the three dates so I need. One of the things that yeah. we wanted to keep the momentum is the county already has agendized for the Board of Supervisors to approve this agreement based on tonight's action if council was to approve for April 29th. And so I've been told that I'll let the county kind of speak to that shortly thereafter. No, no, I need dates. When is the groundbreaking? Does <laughs> the county want to discuss the groundbreaking date? We are discussing it. Do you want to share it with the city? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's not funny. This is a, a community that's been waiting for years for this library. So I'm hoping you have those three dates to share with our community tonight. Good evening, uh, Mayor, members of the Council. My name is Helen Freed. I'm the County Librarian. I'm happy to be here today. As, as you are awaiting the new library, we are also. We've been very, you've been very patient, and we've been wanting to do this, as you know, a couple of years ago, but things happen, and the, the project was delayed. To answer your question, um, if everything goes well, we are hoping to, and don't write this in stone, we are hoping to, <laughs> to open, uh, to do the groundbreaking by June 1st, if everything goes well. 2014? Yes. Okay. And then the completion of the project should be one year later. And again, if all goes well, when the library closes, we're hoping to open the, uh, the, the temporary library. But again, you know, that's depending on a lot of factors. Uh, that's that's the projected date, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to make that. Thank you. Okay. Any other? I'm sorry. Any other questions for? No. no? Okay. I do have one question. If, if I read this incorrectly, the friends' money is still with the friends, That's right? We're, so their two hundred thousand dollars is still protected, right. as had been discussed through this process, right. which is. Great. And I, I do want to clarify one thing with tonight's action. We're actually changing some of the recommendations. One thing that I want to make clear is that we had an amendment attached to the agenda report tonight with regards to amending the funding agreement. And as I've indicated in the last five business days, we've had a number of changes. Um, we will be getting a new funding agreement from the county very shortly. What I'm asking council is to authorize the city manager to execute that amendment. The intent of the amendment is to clarify these dollar amounts 
and also remove reimbursement language that the county will not require us to front, but rather they will just pay for those costs and they won't be our out-of-pocket costs. So uh, the amendment is in favor of the city, but it's still being completed based on the uh, one that you have here, which is a different one. And if I could just jump in for a real quick second, typically we would want to have all that to this in front of the city council before we did this, but I did not want to slow down the momentum of this project. Uh, I really wanted to get it to the Board of Supervisors on April 29th, and I think we've, and we, we, we consulted with the city attorney as well on this, and um, we'll, we'll just bring back the agreement, the addendum uh, Correct. to the city council. So be expecting that, but we've already done the action. Bob. Go, go ahead, Eric. Were you going to say something? I just wanted to say thank you. I just wanted to say that, you know, I appreciate the county's patience. This has been the last four days have been somewhat tedious in terms of drilling down on things, and they've been really great to work with, and they've given us, given us some concessions as well as funding, which has been appreciated. So I just wanted to give that disclaimer. Uh, <clears throat> we got to run back to the funding again because this, this arithmetic is uh, getting past me here. We started at 1.8 million. That's our total cost. Project budget, correct. Okay. So why does our staff report say that the base bid was 1,464? So, Laura, if you would please pull up. Uh, I didn't want to go there, but I will go there since you asked the question. We got to go there. Yeah, we're so we're going to start off with a project budget. Uh, as you'll see, I'm going to use this new. So here you talked about the 1.46 million. That's the base bid for the construction. Um, one deferred maintenance item that was originally going to be our responsibility that has been pulled out in the county will accommodate that funding is the 58,000 for the automated store storefront doors. So truly, just for the sake of my example, it's about 1.4 in construction costs. Then in addition, we have $146,050 in costs related to architecture and engineering agreements. So that's for the architects to build the drawings and the engineer to verify the drawings, et cetera, and create the blueprints. We're also estimating, uh, this is a conservative estimate, of $50,000 in plan and permit fees that will be incurred from this project that are our responsibilities. Then there is the 219600 which is 15% contingency based on the $1.4 million. So now I'm here where I have my total project at 1.82. Then this other group down here will speak specifically to the funding. So as you recall, I referenced the funding agreement. There were three different pots of money that the funding agreement identified. There was the Marblehead funds, which is 250000 which the city currently has that money but would be giving to the county, and that's one of the recommendations on the action tonight to appropriate that so we can make that money available. The six hundred and forty. $6,605, which is Talega funds, which the county already has that money. And then as mentioned earlier by Councilmember Doncheck, the Friends of the Library of the $200,000. But that money was not supposed to be in this. That was my question. My question was we're holding that out. It is. In, a, in the funding agreement, there are steps for the buckets to be used. The Friends of the Library, the third step for funding. So eventually the county will be going to the Friends of the Library for that money. Any money that's Okay, that's not different than the agreement we had last time we met with Steve Franks. He, he felt very strongly that the 200000 could be held by the Friends for technology or other things they might want to do after the new library opened its doors. So that's a change. And I, and I would ask Steve to comment on that. I can't comment on that. Uh, it is part of the funding agreement that is available allocation. Right. That's a change, project. and that's not a very positive change. Um, so that brings us to the amount of money that we have to fund it. Which is and without those funds, though, we, we go upside down. And I, I think the agreement was that that would be the last pot that we had to hit if, if we had to, yeah. But to Council Member Baker's point, at, at the last time we talked about this, it was a million four was the project. So we have basically identified $1.1 $1 .1 million in funding for the project. The county has... Um, offered up 255000 to fund exterior, uh, excuse me, exterior ADA improvements. And there, in, and I, I want to give the disclaimer, this is all subject to the board of the county board supervisor's approval in appropriating this monies. Uh, the county has also spoken today about also giving us an additional $143,700. So that brings in another 398000 in project monies which 
here's the 326, which basically 106,000 is the delta to complete the project plus 15% contingency, which is standard for a construction agreement. So this 326 is where we're asking for council to appropriate that money out of the Devel developer improvement fund. What, what is the, the words non-reimbursable? This is money that will come out of our pocket that we will not get back from a reimbursement from the county. Originally, there was some reimbursable items in the funding agreement, but as I indicated, the amendment will... So, so you're telling me if we don't spend the contingency, we don't get it back? If we don't, oh, the contingency, if we don't spend it, we get it back. Or we, oh. don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't spend it, we don't use it. It stays with oh, us. Oh, okay. All right. All right. And the contingency is going to be subject to city approval Correct. as we go through. If there's any change orders that All are right. subject to our approval. Real quick, Eric. Help me out here. 398000 plus 326000 does not equal 1096 So where's oh, the other 600000 right This is included in this. So the 109, $1,096,000, mm -hmm. the 398, and the 326 come to the $1,821,000. Gotcha. So, Eric, I know you're just the messenger, and this won't be a surprise to our friends at the county, but I don't, for us being on a per capita basis, the largest donor city in the Orange County library system, that the county is only essentially putting in 22% to this project does not feel to me like a partnership. And it troubles me deeply that we have year after year after year of donating and donating and giving and giving. It's in the millions. And still, the county's only willing to put 22 cents on a dollar into this project. Um, and I, I'm not going to stop things tonight because. If one more person goes down Del Mar, which is our iconic street, and says, what is that vacant building over there? It's going to you know, be one person too many for me. But I just don't understand the math. 22 cents out of the dollar coming from the county where we're their most important donating, donating city. And, and i got to tell you, this, <clears throat> this has put it over the top for me. This is, you know, it was okay when we had it funded. But now we're underfunded by three hundred twenty-six thousand dollars. I don't. I can't do it. I got other. <laughs> uh, what happens if we say no? Uh, it would stop at this time because part of the agreement requires the city council to take action before they can go to their board of supervisors. And one of the things just to kind of touch on uh, what city manager Garrison said was there, the, there is a shelf life to construction bids. There are other factors, So, and I'm just wanting to present all the facts to you that could create delays or could require us to read. Yeah, Tim. Tim. It, it, just let me add, but, yeah, but you know, um, this seems to me we don't want to go down that path. I mean, I, I understand exactly, and I'm 100% in agreement with what you're saying, Lori. I understand where you're coming from, Bob, but I think at this stage of the game, uh, yes, it's some disappointing news, but we've got it. We've got to move forward. We've got to get this new library in down there. We can't delay it, and you know, we're going to wind up arguing back and forth about this for another couple of months or whatever and this thing's just going to get more expensive and move out in time. We don't want that. And I, again, I, I can't make promises or guarantees, but I can tell you and commit to that we are going to be very physically conservative in the contingency. So, you know, that's the money that is the more we hold on to it, the more we don't spend. But again, it's a construction contract and there are always potential. We didn't know that was there and now there's going to be a cost to it. And, and Eric, I appreciate and I believe in you 100%, but who's leading this project, the county or the city? Uh, the e county is the lead. Agency. Even though they're the minority stakeholder financially, they're in charge of making this happen. That's, That's correct. the strangest business deal I've heard of recently. So what happens if we do have cost overruns? Is that on us? Uh, well, by us appropriating the 326, we're basically setting aside $219,000 for potential overruns with a 15% cap. Those have to come to us for us to approve them before they can 
start to fund those. And so we would take a proactive approach with working with the county to make sure and minimize those costs. I got a couple questions for you, Eric. Sure. The Friends of San Clemente funds, or funds, Friends of the Library funds, why is that delineated as county funds on here? Well, the, and I, uh, it, it's funds that will go to the county as part of the funding agreement that was okay. established in 2000. Go to the county. That is correct. Okay, and then can you break out for me the line above that county and city Telega funds? Can you break out the difference between those two? Uh, those Telega funds are already in the county's possession based on the Telega. That's why they're lumped together. Can you, so can you break out? And when we started the process, yeah. what amazed me is nobody even knew that those funds existed. We went looking for because I was president of the Friends of the Library in this time frame when we came up with the 200,000. And when we went looking for funding, there were, somebody said there was some money collected in Telega. Well, where is it? And we couldn't find it. And all of a sudden, we did find it. Uh, the county found it. That they had already been holding on to it. So, so it seems to me, Lori and Bob, maybe you can help me out with understanding this. Is this is 1.9 million dollars subtract out whatever county fees there are if we decide to build our own library in the future? Correct. Is that a correct statement, Eric? All right. I am well, minus the county funds, I said. The question would be, obviously, and I understand where you're coming from, Council Member Ham, is obviously getting those monies from the county back to the city coffers. Because those funds were collected for the purpose of building a library in the city of San Clemente, regardless of who builds it. That is correct. So, in theory, we have rights to those to those funds. So that's one roughly $1.1 million plus the additional 326000 of contingency funds. That's $1.4 million that we have to build the library. If we choose to do so, future, we'd have to review the agreement to see exactly how we negotiate the return of those funds. If we have to buy any assets, etc., as well. And, and just a follow up to that is: have some of those funds already been spent? Um, we had a lot of architecture work done. We've had the plans redone several times. We changes made, so I know there's money's been spent. And the question is, you know, where did that come from? Um, there have been some costs that have already been borne relative to the architect and engineering agreement, and also some city funds. But I'm thinking what we need to do is give the green light tonight on this, um, even though it feels like a bad deal for the city but I think that having watched the Laguna Niguel library come to be through the county and so forth and so on um, we owe it to the citizens to get this built um, but I think again short term long term we're going to have to look really hard at to because to Pro Mayor Pro Tem uh, Ham's point over and above this money which belongs to our citizens every year we're putting money into the system and um, apparently we're not appreciated for the generosity of our city uh, and this would have been a great place for the county to say hey you know this is how we give back to donor cities and for whatever reason they are unable or unwilling to do that but I think in the short term we do need to go forward with this and get this project going um, and Jim to your point there have been so many plans on this you know, including the plan where somebody forgot to make it ADA accessible. So, um, and there have been so many project managers, and it's just time to get, let's get going. Let's get a shovel in the ground. Yeah. So I will make a motion unless we want to continue talking. Uh, you know, I just have to say from my, from my perspective, I think the last, when we had the long-term, the, the recent long-term financial planning meeting became very stark in terms of how much we're paying and what we're getting and this is this is just seems to be resounding in that theme uh, and it's unfortunate and frankly it's the writing on the wall before we make a motion I just made a comment that it seems to me that the management of the county issues like this continue to rise and, and come about for not just our city but other cities and, and it doesn't make sense to me that when you have a city that's donating so much to the system that the managers aren't recognizing those groups as large partners 
doesn't make sense to me. And this is happening across the board, not just with the county library system. So I, I think the county needs to take notice and look where their funds are coming from and, and divvy those up appropriately in the future. So that's my two cents on this. Yes, um, I'll, I will make the motion since I have been um, involved in this project for many years. All right, so um, I recommend, wait, let me read it off the agenda. Actually, I'm going to have to modify it. Let me think about this for a minute. Okay, so I'm going to approve the county, I'm going to move that we approve the County of Orange's project budget as pre uh, presented by Assistant City Manager Sun tonight um, and the form of the county's construction contract. I'm going to approve and authorize the mayor to execute the amendment to the lease agreement, contract C11-37 by and between the City of San Clemente and County of Orange concerning the library expansion once it's been amended. All right. Um, and in time for the April 29th County Supervisors uh, staff packet. Uh, I'm going to move that we uh, approve an appropriation of 250000 to account 037-867-45300 and the Developers Improvement Fund representing funds from the Marblehead Coastal Developers Agreement. I'm going to approve an appropriation, I recommend that we approve an appropriation, is this number right? Yes, the 112395 to account 037867. Actually, no, that, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. That number changed? That number has changed to, can I have a copy of? 326345 dollars. 326345, okay. So this is a staff recommendation item four. Um, move that we approve an appropriation of 326300 and Forty-five. Forty-five dollars to account number 037-867-54300 and the Developers Improvement Fund representing funds for improvements expected to be reimbursed from the County of Orange per the approved. And the, the, just to clarify, away. the action will not, those, uh, the right, that goes away. Six will not be reimbursable. Okay, let me read it exactly as, okay. Approve, this is number four. Move that we approve an appropriation of $326,345 to account 037-867-54300 in the Developers Improvement Fund representing funds for the library expansion project. That's the motion. I'll second that. Before, before we vote, I have one more question for staff. Uh, what happens if this goes to the county and, and they do not approve it? If the county does not appropriate the monies, then um, I, I'm going to look to a Jeep, but the way I interpreted the agreement that it would be terminated because okay. the monies would not be there. Correct. They have the right to terminate the agreement at that point. And then we'll, then we'll have a next step. We have, we have a motion on the table by Don Chuck and a second by Everett. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? I'm opposed. I can't support a project that's that much over budget when we haven't even started. Okay. Passes 4-1 with Baker Thank opposing. You. And momentum is the word of the day. Hmm. Oral communications part two. I don't have any cards. Uh, next is uh, an item relating to establishment of interview appointment dates to fill, fill vacancies on city commissions and committees as well as the Friends of the Reserve Commission. Um, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, it's that time of year again when uh, the various positions become available on our commissions and committees. My staff report indicated that the terms of 17 individuals would be coming up, um, would be terminating June 30th. I have become aware of one more. Um, Bob Wright, uh, for health reasons, uh, is relinquishing his position on the Human Affairs Committee. So I would um, uh, ch change th the vacancies in my staff report to indicate three vacancies for two full year terms as well as to fill uh, Mr. Wright's unexpired term that is uh, due to expire next June. So I have placed uh, copies of a calendar in front of you that shows the dates that the council chambers is available in June and I would recommend that you select two dates for the interview sessions. And for everybody's information I will be out of town from the 4th until the uh, 16th. Jeez Bob where are you going? Can I go with you? I'm just kidding. I'll be out of town oh. the 21st through the 28th. Really? Uh-huh. 
Well, that really narrows the dates. I'm sorry. So what were the dates again? 4th through the 18th and the 21st to the 28th? Mm -hmm. The 19th? <laughs> How does July 1 look if we did June 30th and July 1? Joanne. Because it's nice to do them back to back. July 1, that would be council. Why don't we do the 19th and the 30th? Isn't that the Thursday? That's the gap mm -hmm. between Bob and Chris. I, I don't think I have a conflict, but we'll see. And it's really nice to do them back. To it's nice to get them done. And then Monday night. And Dark Friday's on the 20th. Dark Friday on the 20th. Is that why the council chambers are? are uh... Right, that's dark. You could, you could always do that date. You could do a Saturday if you like. Uh, we could do it on the 19th and 20th. Huh. Sorry. We could. I won't be available the evening of the 20th. Maybe Bill. Bill. Yeah. Well, I, think I'm, I think I'm actually working the 19th, so that, that won't work for me either, but. Not the 19th either? No. How about July 2nd and 3rd? Well, now we're infringing well, on a very important holiday there. The second would be the there. Planning Commission, maybe. Oh, yeah, that's right. All right. All right, let's figure out June. Bob, you were going on the 4th of the what? 16th. So how about the 2nd and the 3rd? What about the, June? the 17th? The 3rd is the primary election. And so the chamber. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I... Well, hold on. What about the 18th, then? Did, did... Well, no. well, I'm not sure what the reason is, but the council chambers is not available. That's planning commission. Okay. What about the meeting, a council meeting on the 17th? Can we use part of that? You would probably want to come in early because I don't think we want to televise that. People are so nervous. Being so interviewed, we just, but we could do it. We could do it early. Uh, I'll tell you what. Why don't we? Uh, what was wrong with the 18th? Can we have them move back that date so we could maybe take the chambers from four to six and have them start? At six? That's a little bit of. <laughs> we can ask. <laughs> It's council's direction. Bob, what time do you get back on the 16th? Uh, in, the, in the afternoon. Thanks, sir. Well, we, actually, we could conceivably do the 17th and the 19th, which is a Tuesday and a Thursday. Uh, yeah. Oh, he said no to the 19th. Well, can we go to shift? I don't know what my calendar does. June 19th. No, I'm not going to be off for that because I'm already taking that whole next week off. The 18th was on the 18th? Planning Commission. We can do it early on the Planning Commission, say. 17th, we're going to do it. Can we do it before the council meeting on the 17th? And well, yeah, we're already planning on that. That's not bad. So you would probably want to allocate at least four hours because they always seem to go longer than we think. So three o'clock on the 17th and four o'clock on the 18th or something like that. Three to six. Move the closed session to the back end of the council meeting. It's a lot of meetings. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Planning commission and usually typically starts gone, you know, for at least four hours. And what time does planning past. commission start? Planning commission starts at seven, unless there's a study session, which and then it starts at six. So, so three to six, four to seven. We'll just have to let them know there's no study session that day. Joanne, on for, for, on the planning commission day, three to six. No, 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 council three to six. Mm -hmm. That's not televised. You can. I don't think it's going to get you through one session though. Because we've, at least in the past, we've never gotten out for less than four hours. 
each day. Can we can we do the um, it, you know there are less intense positions. Can we take down the maybe the less intense ones on the first day? Sure, I could do and that. And order it so the planning commission is on the next day, mm -hmm. uh, which we, would be we, because you've got planning commission interviews and then planning commission right after. Yeah. So we could um, do this. Can what I? if it was July seven eight, which is a Monday Tuesday? Is there any reason well, it has to be? We normally mentioned? sat it before the mm -hmm. first planning commission meeting, right? You do it, however, the code says that the terms expire June 30th or until a successor is appointed. The, uh, can, I, can I just throw in one thing? The deputy city clerk just reminded me you could do these off site. You don't have to do these here. You right. could do They're the interviews. Televised. Right. You could do these interviews somewhere else. That's an excellent suggestion. Yeah, we could do it. In, for, for example, we could do a second floor and go show or wherever. Then you, then you could probably pick your dates. We could do 17, do it like you were suggesting, the light, lighter ones, and then we can, 18, do it. We can do 17 here, and then the 18. So you're thinking, or nine, ten uh, goes, yeah. are we thinking three to six on the 17th? Sure. Maybe do Beaches, Parks, and Rec. Um, human Affairs. Investment Advisory, Human Affairs. And then, um, and then to get community development for the 18th and go four to. Oh, no. Planning Commission should not be on the concurred. Wednesday because if you had a seated Planning Commissioner who wanted to reapply. If you start at four with that, they'll be done. That's three hours of time to make it through those. Yeah, okay. We can, we could have them go first. So the yeah. Planning Commission would be the first interviewees on that Wednesday starting at four. And we just have to be resolved to complete our interviews by, by 630. Joanne? Four o'clock on the 18th. Well, I'm going to check. I haven't checked the rooms. That's that's the only thing with the off-site. But I'll I'll check to see if uh, the community development conference room where we have leadership is available. If if it's not, I guess I'll be back. Or I'll find something. Okay. No, I've got it. Are we okay with that? Mm hmm Okay. 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 City manager. Was it my turn? Um, I just wanted to point out, uh, in case the council didn't notice, but at, and by popular request, we have the monitors back up, and they're live, so it, they're not hesitating. And I believe the back room also has uh, live ones now because of that was kind of, you know, they were a little bit behind all the time there, too. So a lot of work went into that, so thanks to the IT staff. And I believe this little machine over here is also being utilized, and they can use the mouse so they're not, so it's not jumping around for council. So minor item, but uh, I know it's important. So. Can we get rid of the corner TVs at the same time we did the big screen? Uh, yes, but then, but then we, yeah, but these are nicer. The 80 style except I, so except when, except when I look up and see myself. That's. Uh, um, and I think council was going to cover the uh, the activity that took place yesterday morning. Was what somebody's going to cover? Bob's, that? Okay. Bob's, Bob's, yep, that was the only thing. Okay, um, city attorney. Nothing to report. Thank you, Gene. Council member, starting to my left. Nada. Nada. What time do we say on 18th? 4 p.m. Chris, anything for the? Nothing. Okay. Uh, I have nothing. Uh, actually, I, I will say, I'm sorry, I will say one thing. Uh, I gave the State of the City um, this past Friday uh, at Bella Kalina. Uh, copies of that will be made available on the city website and uh, so that folks can download it. And then I think the game plan is, is we're going to maybe re-record it uh, as the presentation was done and have that video available also on the website for people to hear it and and uh, get a chance to hear about some of the changes in San Clemente. I think that's a wonderful idea, by the way. Wonderful. Excellent. Uh, Laura, would you uh, show some slides for me? Yesterday down at the... <laughs> Yesterday down at the pier, we had the uh, Marines from HMLA uh, 469, our adopted unit, come up and help us out with a bunch of stuff. It was uh, it was very well attended, and uh, these guys didn't know they were going to be 
painting the pier when they signed up for the United States Marine Corps. But they did a great job. They had a great time. The citizens that walked out on the pier and encouraged them had a great time saying hello and thanking them for their service. And they did a lot of great things in, in town here. And uh, they also did some work on the on the uh, Palapa down there, I guess. What, and also at Park Semper Fi looks great. Got a great haircut up there. These uh, guys know how to give haircuts. They do, just like the guy on the left there. The, the Park Semper Fi's got the same same sort of haircut. So uh, I want to, th and they thanked. Uh, by the way, I, I've said this many times, but when the Marines come and do things in San Clemente. They're always sure to thank the citizens of San Clemente for their tremendous support of the Marine Corps. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Joyce certainly did that over and over. Uh, his men did that. And a personal thanks to uh, Wayne Eggleston for, for uh, making this happen and, and also General Busby for putting the bill for a lot of this. So uh, a lot of people are involved and uh, our young men and women in the Marine Corps did it did a great job for us here in San Clemente. So I want to thank them. And, and Bob, can, can, I, I believe that there was a few members of city staff that were also big movers behind that. Was it, was it, well, Sharon was important, but there was, um, uh, Mark Chavez, who Mark. you already mentioned, we, we put him up front because he was really the key to this thing happening. Uh, you know, Dennis Roger Reed, of course, helped, uh, Nathan Bloom was down there. Um, Brent Hoffenberg was down there. I know I'm missing some folks. Uh, oh, I know who you're missing. Ones. Put that slide back up. Oh. Who's standing front and center there? Is that you, city manager? Uh, right yeah, there, I yeah. Think, yeah. You the I, guy I, I that thought, who's that uh, old uh, Marine? So, so, How is he so, still yeah. in the Corps? That's, that's yeah. the, the guy in the Air Force is the yeah. long-haired one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, yeah, we asked for a few volunteers, and all of a sudden, Sarah Over was out there helping, of course, that's you know, great. set this whole thing up. And uh, all of a sudden, we had this big crowd. But did you notice the Marine down at the bottom? That's the, that's the great guy. See the, see the little the one all the way on, yeah. the, on the decking there? <laughs> and and then and then also at um, Bob's recommendation, we've also drafted a letter to General Busby uh, in thanks from uh, the city uh, for allowing his men to come and help. Um, we are really blessed by having this close proximity to Camp Pendleton to be able to have this relationship. Yeah, we should. Um, and it looks great, by the way. I went down there the, early this morning, and it really looks fabulous. They did a great job. And I didn't see too much bill paint either. So. But Wayne didn't have any paint on him, though. I, I noticed that. Wayne was just wandering around, and I, I did uh, I did talk to him a little bit about that. So he, he was definitely ordering the, those guys around, though. Uh, Wayne did a great it job. Was, it was that. actually pretty funny. He, yeah, I, I believe he's the captain of Park Semper Fi. <laughs> yeah. Official. Uh, captain is not a, a high enough rank Admiral? for the uh, supreme commander yeah, of something. Right. Yeah. 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 Wayne, if you're listening of the galaxy, yeah. Yeah. he wants a jacket, by the way, with that on. I think so. We can get him a nice Admiral hat, you know. Oh, and are you going to mention the high school play, by the way? I can, but then. Yeah, can you mention it? Yeah. Okay. Um, first, I'm going to do an OCTA report. And um, I sent these notes to the city clerk so that you don't have to follow along too closely. Um, the OCTA is issuing their long-range transportation plan, which is their LRTP draft, and it's being released for a 45-day review. And what I'd like to do, I expect the city will get a copy, and um, I'd like to request that staff prepare a response to the long-range uh, transportation plan, take a look at it, and um, reply, get it to council, and then reply within the 45-day span. Here are some things that I think are important to consider as staff reviews the um, document. First of all, um, please affirm city support for the continuation of the HOV lane from Pico to the San Diego County border. That re um, appears in what's called the preference plan, preferred plan, and it's in there for a cost of $286 million. And uh, thank you to Council Member uh, Baker as mayor for making sure that got in there. Um, two, um, if in light of the TCA announcement last week, if you could request that all future maps in their long range plan, which look like this, um, no longer show the 241 going all the way down to San Diego, but capture the TCA's new announcement, which you know has the terminus at Cow Camp. And um, this is not a trivial request because um, th what was decided by TCA versus what's on the map can be two different things. But I think it's in San Clemente's best interest to have this map always end at Cow Camp for 241. That's the second point. Um, 
Thirdly, um, urge OCTA to take a look at congestion management in San Clemente as Sandag has eight general lanes plus four high occupancy toll lanes planned to end at the county border by 2050. So if you can imagine a funnel, that's what it's going to feel like if you're down by trestles. Um, and while encouraging that congestion management scrutiny, um, there are some things. There's the baseline plan, the preferred plan, and the concept plan. In the concept plan are some items that we might want to, as a city, bring forward um, for higher priority. One of them is the El Camino Real interchange improvements. That, in my opinion, should be combined with any HOV extension that goes on down there because that's what we're doing at Vista Hermosa and Pico. So that would be one. Uh, two, there's um, a project which is a northbound climbing lane for trucks from Pico going north to Vaquero. Um, I'd like to see that moved forward. It's a great idea, and if the toll road's going away, we're going to need all the help we can at the south end of the county. Um, the third is there's a project, and I'm not sure what the details are, but it's called an interchange improvement uh, for the PCH and the I-5. And so if that's – so that's basically up in uh, – that uh, part of the I-5 freeway that goes through our jurisdiction. And then finally, if you could mention anything in the new general plan circulation element that bears uh, mention. So I'm sure Bill Cameron and Tom Franks and you are going to, you know, have other things to add, but those are the big ones um, that I feel as a council we should um, capture. We will draft that. In their, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, or we can have copies of that. Um, that we can have made available to us? Yes, that's a good idea. When the tra good draft, if it doesn't Absolutely. come in the next well, I'll week. I'll circulate that. Yeah, if you could circulate copies. And did you say that you did share those notes? Yeah, I sent okay, them to you perfect. so that you okay, have them. Good. So, no, I haven't seen those um, yet. So, so, th perfect. so that's that. And then um, if you are a very major general, is that what the song is? Major, right? Mon major, major Modern General. Yes. Um, and the name of the play is, I'm going for Pirates of Penzance. Pirates of Penzance, the, steam, the steampunk the version yeah, yeah. is playing. There's a preview Thursday. It's Friday, Saturday, and I believe Sunday, and it's supposed to be fabulous. I plan to be there Friday night. And uh, encourage anybody to call the high school if they're interested in tickets. And then, it's a, and then the next weekend... And then the next weekend from the 24th, 25th, and 26th as well for Pirates of Penzance. So it's it's two weekends. It's going to okay. be those, those two together. Teacher order. Uh, and we did the groundbreaking for La Pata. Okay. Oh, and so all of us were there for the groundbreaking of speed. If, yeah, it's all things transportation. Uh, the Lapata extension groundbreaking took place. We all we all went there. You were there in spirit. You were you were in there in spirit. Um, even Akram Hindiye, who was one of the chief San Clemente architects, was there, um, and um, it was a real memorable. Um, <clears throat> well done, and um, what we got twenty eight months. And it'll be open for business. I have a question for you since we're talking about OCTA and La Pata. I'm going to put you on the okay. spot here real quick. Is there any discussion or plans for the future to extend La Pata south? Oh, um, two answers to that question. Um, that's brilliant. That should be in the letter. Um, <laughs> I just come up with these things. You know, yeah, that was top. good. Um, but the La Pata extension, even though OCTA is a financial stakeholder and it, it's a county-driven project, and so, but that's a really appropriate question to be asking in light of the recent decisions by the TCA. If we can, the idea would be La Pata to Christianitos, right? Yeah, yeah the, the idea was extending right to yeah. Christianitos. It can't. Yeah. And the history on that is that the topography is staggeringly challenging, and you've got the base that would have to be a partner in that. Mm -hmm. But um, that's a good question to bring up. Anything else from council? Okay. You, you know, by the way, we, I do have to add, um, listening to your state of the, the city, one of the outstanding things about it was that what you talked about change. And just talking about La Pata here just reminded me of the words and what you used that night. And I thought that was great because we got some huge things happening, and they're all coming at once between I-5, the outlet center, and La Pata. We guess residential, residential and the residential park all the next here. four years. Yep, yep. A kind of critical time. So. All right, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move that we adjourn to an adjourn regular meeting to be held on May 6, 2014. Closed session items will be considered.